uh, so uh, hello uh, uh, everyone um, and I would like to thank you uh, Christoph and uh, Paulina for uh, giving me the chance to present some findings of my current research uh, project uh, within this forum but um, I must admit at the very uh, outset that I will say little as to the relation between text and image today um, and rather I will speak solely to the issues of uh, meaning making um, in literary sources specifically and more narrowly still to the emergence of Avadana literature um, uh, as a distinct narrative mode in Gandhara in the early common era. So that a strong uh, relation existed between Avadanas and arts need hardly be stated. Uh, of course, and although this is not particularly true of Gandhara, where artistic renderings of Avadanas um, are almost entirely absent, um, uh, elsewhere in the monastic cave complexes of Central Asia and China, as uh, several studies have shown, numerous paintings have been identified uh, whose inspiration was drawn from certain Avadana compendia that were compiled and composed in Gandhara some centuries prior. Um, now, several of these collections are the focus of my research, uh, and my hope, therefore, is that my presentation today will uh, perhaps contribute to this overall picture by nuancing uh, the early development of Avadana and by challenging certain current assumptions about what an Avadana is, or rather was considered to be historically. Specifically, I first want to take a closer look at certain emic definitions of avadana as analogy, which is uh, drishtanta in Sanskrit or piyu in Chinese, uh, and examine the historical reasons uh, for and the effects this definition had on the shape of the canon uh, and notions of canonicity. Uh, finally, I shall also reflect a little bit on the principle of analogy itself, and so its value uh, to the process of meaning making uh, in narrative. Um, oops. Um, so since the late 19th century, scholarship has struggled to define Avadana. Uh, and this is true both from an etymological perspective, for the precise derivation of the term has yet to and most likely never will be resolved, uh, as well as from a typological perspective, as there is no formal description that can adequately encapsulate all narratives labelled as such. The result today is that we are left with a decidedly indeterminate and ahistoric notion of Avadana, or more specifically, the Avadana type. And this is a deliberately general category uh, designed to encapsulate certain later works of the so-called classic Avadanas, such as the Avadana Shataka, which uh, are known to illustrate the workings of karma across past, present uh, and future existences uh, of individuals in the narrative. Um, but it is also designed to include others, such as the earliest known Avadanas uh, uh, now, which are extant in certain Kaharoshti manuscripts uh, from Gandhara, or indeed an early Chinese translation, which have little to do with causality or temporality, uh, and are more often than not better understood as parables. Um, so most scholars today continue to operate with an understanding of Avadana that is based on the former definition, namely that these narratives are concerned with cause and effect specifically. Um, a point to are uh, often underappreciated, however, <clears throat> is that it was precisely the parabolic function of Avadanas which led Sarvastivadan scholars of the early common era to first define them as analogies. Um, so they regarded Avadanas to be present within existent sutra and Vinaya literature, wherein they functioned as a form of figuration designed to illustrate or example a specific ideology, whether as a precedent when justifying cases of monastic law, or more widely as an exemplum when serving to instantiate a doctrinal principle. But the purpose of their definition was not merely that of clarification. They sought, uh, moreover, to reify Avadana as one of three newly formed limbs of the now 12-fold corpus, the Dvadashanga or the Sha funding. The claim, therefore, was to have discerned a distinct tonality to the Buddha's word, the Buddha Vachana, and realized in this move was nothing less, less than a radical reshaping of the canon uh, and uh, the idea uh, of canonicity. So um, these acts of uh, definition and recanonization <clears throat> uh, initially led to the identification, extraction, and compilation of analogical narratives from existent canonical works, such as the Vinaya. Uh, and this ultimately resulted in the formation of some of the Avadana compendia uh, that we have today. Uh, but it also precipitated a flurry of new compositions bearing the title Avadana, 
However, neither the definition of Avadana as analogy nor its status as a canonical limb within the 12-fold scheme of which it was a constituting, uh, constituting part um, <clears throat> were ubiquitous, ubiquitously recognized among monastic groups, and nor indeed was Avadana uncontestably uh, accepted by those who did recognize it. So for the Mahasangikas and the Theravadins, uh, Avadana was entirely rejected as the Buddha's word, and to that extent it was excluded for, uh, both from the scheme of the three baskets uh, being relegated to the crazy canonical status of miscellany, Kshudraka, um, and it was also excluded from the system of the nine limbs of the Buddha's word, the Navanga you see listed here on the left, which included Sutra, Gaya, Vyakarana, Gata, Udana, Ichuktaka, Jataka, Vaipulya, and Adbuta Dharma. But even among the Sarvastivadins, Mahishasikas, and Dharmaguptakas, who did recognize the three additional members of the 12 fold scheme, uh, namely Nidana, Avadana, and Upadesha, highlighted here in bold, there was still disagreement as to their precise canonical status. For the Dharmaguptakas, Avadana was placed in the fourth basket, the Kshudraka Pitaka, so it was uh, also treated as miscellany, uh, albeit in this case canonical. But for the Sarvastivadins, it was located un unashamedly. And thus, perhaps more controversially, in both the Sutra Pitaka and the Vinaya Pitaka, affirming its status as uncontestably canonical. Um, so, the relative confidence uh, of the Sarvasti Vardhans is perhaps reflected in the specific ordering of their listing, which, unlike those of the Mahishasakas and Dhammaguptakas, nestled Avadana between Nidana on the one side and uh, it Itivrtika and Jataka on the other. Um, and its insertion here was quite deliberate. For Avadana, Itivritika, and Jataka were uniquely affirmed by the Sarvastivadins as something of thematic triplets. And the scholastic texts of this monastic group evidence a concerted attempt to establish an appositional affinity uh, between them. And um, uh, this entailed not only a definition of Avadana as a new uh, limb, uh, but also a distinct reading of Ichuktika or Itivritika, meaning uh, thus spoken for itivrtika meaning occurrence. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, limb too must therefore be treated as a new canonical category from the Salvastivadan perspective. Now, the reason for their being grouped as such, as I hope to show, um, is attributable to the fact that they were all regarded as analogies. And this brings us to our first definition found in the Abhidhamma Mahavibhasha, which, which reads, um, What is Avadana? It denotes the various analogies taught in the sutras, such as the Dirgila Avadana or Maha Avadana. According to the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, it is taught by bearers of the Vinaya. What is Itivrtika? It denotes explanations of past time events seen or heard in the sutras. For example, it is said, in the past there was a great royal capital named Kushavati and a ruler named Sudarshana. Or in the past there was a Buddha named Vipashtian who taught such a dharma for the disciples. Or in the past there was a Buddha named Shikin, Vishvabhu, Krakuchanda, Kanakamuni and Kashipa who taught such a dharma for the disciples and so forth. What is Jataka? It denotes the explanations of birth events experienced in the past, such as the Jataka Sutras of the bear, deer, etc. Or, for example, when the Buddha taught the Panchashataka Jataka because of Devadatta. So Avadana is unique here for it being designated functionally as an analogy rather than formally in terms of the contents of which it is comprised. And this is generally true of other contemporaneous definitions uh, in other sources, uh, such as the second century Udana, the Chuyaojing in Chinese, or indeed the Mahaparinirvana Sutra cited here, wherein Avadana is more explicitly defined as a precedent in the Vinaya, namely an analogical narrative designed to example and so justify a case of monastic law. Um, Itivritika and Jataka are contrastingly formally defined and indeed in rather similar terms, the former being concerned with past events and the latter with past births of the Bodhisattva. But what is important to note here is a certain fluidity between these three limbs in both form and function. In the case of Itivritika, the example of narratives concerning such past Buddhas as Vipassian is in fact a description of the Maha Avadana mentioned above, implying that a narrative can be both Itivritika formally and Avadana functionally. Um, and it should perhaps be added here that um, later definitions of Avadana from the fifth century would come to define it as illustrating the past acts of individuals other than the Bodhisattva, thus coinciding somewhat with Itivritika. Um, 
And it is this principle uh, that is quite descriptive of many of the more famous uh, Avadanas from the Mula Savastivada, Vinaya and related uh, collections like the Avadana uh, Shatakam and the Divya Avadana. Um, so the citation here of the Pancha Shataka Jataka is taken from the Sangha Veda Vastu of the Sarvastivada Vinaya, where in the past births of the Bodhisattva Ananda and Devadatta and a congregation of 500 monks, um, hence the Pancha Shataka, uh, are described to analogize the current schismatic state of monastic affairs. So both um, Itivrataka and Jataka, uh, like Avadana, thus also functioned as analogies in the Vinaya and could, and could to that extent be potentially subsumed under it. Uh, so the subs... Ooh. Um, so the subsumptive uh, function of Avadana as analogy um, is indeed made quite clear by another passage you see here in the Vinishtaya Samgrahani, which reads, Further in the Vinaya, there are in brief five different types of analogies which can clarify the sense of a teaching, a past birth, past occurrence, simile, a metaphorical association, and an avadana. Jataka denotes the activities of the bodhisattva in former births. Itivrutaka denotes what is related to former connections. Upama denotes such comparisons as milk, cream, curd, and butter as being like the highest pudgala, and the comparison of seven types of pudgalas in a river in the world as being like the seven types of pudgalas in the true dharma. Other similes of this kind should be comprehended. Upachara denotes, excuse me, the comparison of the great king or the comparison of the good doctor. Other comparisons of this kind are innumerable. According to the defiled and pure kinds, there are other comparisons in the present world which depend either on the defiled kind or on the pure kind. It is because of these partial identities that metaphorical associations are taught. Avadana denotes extended and numerous analogies, such as the Dirgila Avadana and innumerable others of this kind. <clears throat> um, so it has perhaps uh, struck you as curious that Avadana is here given as the final member of the list of five analogies and has as a result been separated by the categories of simile and metaphor. Uh, from Jataka and Itivrataka, which in the context of this list, it would more logically proceed or follow. The distinct finality of its position and the fact that it alone is glossed with analogy, the centerpiece of this metalinguistic picture, uh, would perhaps indicate the special status of Avadana. So thus again, whereas the other four are formally defined, Avadana alone is ex explicated by virtue of its being analogical per se, and thus it alone shares this functional trait with the other four members. In the Vinaya, Jataka, Itivrataka, Upama, and Avadana all share in certain traits. Uh, structurally, they are all embedded within a main narrative and are framed by the expression in the past, Bhuta Puravam. And though distinct in certain formal aspects, all functioned to analogize a specific principle in the narrative whole. Um, so we are here simply told that an analogy serves to clarify the sense of the teaching, um, but elsewhere in this same text, or more specifically within the Bodhisattva Bhumi, both Jataka and Itivrataka are presented as having precise purposes in light of the formal tenets attributed to them. Uh, Jataka is said to generate faith towards the Buddha by presenting the Bodhisattva's glorious acts of self-sacrifice, <clears throat> and it is no doubt for reason of exampling such donative acts that it is almost exclusively artistic renderings of Jatakas, uh, which populate stupa sites in Gandhara. And uh, Iti Vritika is said to eradicate notions of eternalism by way of narrating the law of causality. So this situates these two narrative modes quite firmly in relation to, the Buddha's, uh, to Buddhism's overall telos and makes clear that these narratives were taught to inculcate individuals with Buddhism's specific salvif salvific ideologies. Um, but the question remains, why, was, why the metacategory of Avadana uh, as analogy was singled out to encapsulate the rhetorical force of all these narrative forms? That we observe for the first time in Gandhara in the early common era, a burgeoning of such narrative compositions bearing these titles would appear sufficient proof of its instrumentality. And if we turn um, to consider such early narrative compendia, we, are, we can indeed see that Avadana as analogy served as their organizing principle rather that is than the principle of causality typically used to define it. <clears throat> 
So first, in the British Library collection, there are 21 analyzable narratives, <clears throat> of which seven are named Abhidhana, three Purva Yoga, uh, which we may understand to be Itivrutika in light of the definitions we just considered, uh, and one Drishtanta and Uddharana each. Uh, several of these stories, moreover, contain abbreviation formulae in which we see quite plainly the influence of analogy. For example, one often encounters the formula that the expansion, namely of the narrative, uh, should be according to the comparison. And similarly, in the Kalpana Manditika Drishtanta Pankti, we also read, this is the analogy, Drishtanta, this again should be regarded as the meaning. Um, uh, such terms as Udaharana, Upamana, and Drishtanta are all close synonyms, denoting different forms of analogy, and in this case, referring to the fact that these analogies and uh, narratives were intended as examples or illustrations of a specific message, whether a doctrinal, moral, or legal tenet. And um, much the same influence uh, is observed in the Samyukta Abhadana, which is dated to the Eastern Han period uh, in the second century CE and could well be one of the earliest such Abhadana compendia to be translated into Chinese. Um, so for here too, we encounter analogical narratives, including illustrations and metaphors with only a select few Purva Yoga or Jataka types concerned with causality. And in our third and fourth examples, we also have two collections, the Udana and Kalpana Manditika, which were compiled or composed in Gandhara by Dharmatrata and Kumaralata, respectively, both of whom belong to one stream of Abhidharma thought named Darshtantika, namely those who use analogies. It is, of course, interesting that two Abhidhamas were also engaged in narrative composition, and I have yet to determine the exact relation between their philosophy uh, and their narratives. Nonetheless, I can say that in these two works, narratives are used to analogize aphoristic statements which tersely communicate, communicate central tenets of Buddhist ideology, such as the verses of the Dharmapada in the case of the Udana. Um, so on the basis of uh, such evidence, it seems quite clear that in the early centuries of the common era in Gandhara, the principle of analogy was directing the composition of these new narrative modes. And in such a scenario, one is compelled to ask why analogy served as the basis for this output. Um, but terms for analogy were all but unknown to Buddhist sources until this time, and they had only recently gained currency elsewhere in non-Buddhist treatises, treating drama, governance, grammar, and logic. In drama, the Natya Shastra stay, uh, regards analogy as a central quality, a lakshana of a play, which captivates the minds of the audience and demonstrates the purpose of a given idea uh, conveyed by the performance. In regards to governance, the Alta Shastra presents examples, Udaharana, and analogies, Drishtanta, as necessary for the completeness of a ruler's edict or the formation of treatises on law. In grammar, the Mahabhashya of Patanjali treats analogy as an aspect of everyday language produced by human undertaking, which he uses to illustrate certain grammatical principles. And in logic, the Nyaya Sutra states that analogy is a thing upon which both everyday observers and scholastic investigators agree, out of which we have the famous example of inferring fire on the hill due to the experience of smoke uh, in analogous cases, uh, such as the kitchen, uh, as we know uh, famously from the Nyaya Fivefold Syllogism. Um, so that analogy is able to traverse these distinct discursive slopes is rather simple. In each of these treatises, analogy functions as an inferential mode of reasoning, a quotidian act of drawing a comparison between two or more cases that have been perceived, drishta, and by means of which a common conclusion, anta, can be drawn. Its widespread appearance in contemporaneous discourses thus represents, uh, I would suggest, an epistemological turn characterized by an acute recognition of the propositional nature of knowledge and the need to develop strategies to justify it. The definition of Avadana as analogy is very much a child of this time and was born in a context where, infer in, where inference um, was becoming increasingly formalized. By rendering analogy in the narrative mode of uh, Avadana, such Buddhists as the Dashtantikas were thus developing a means to convincingly articulate their own theories, often vis-a-vis -vis other competing systems of thoughts. And there are many narratives that um, indicate this. Now, the history of such terms as Drishtanta has uh, yet to be written, and it is the next task uh, of my research project. Um, so at this stage, I, uh, I'm afraid I uh, cannot elucidate in full the details of this uh, proposed epistemological turn to which I understand the emergence of Avadana to belong. Uh, 
Um, but nonetheless, in the final part of uh, today's presentation, I shall look a little bit more closely at the role of Avadana as analogy in the process of meaning making by considering a single case study, uh, namely the Dirgila Avadana, uh, which to recall was the text uh, cited in all the definitions of Avadana that we just considered. Uh, so let's first take a look at how I understand a narrative analogy to function. Mm. <clears throat> so um, a Buddhist narrative is typically structured by two components. Uh, first, a main narrative, which describes the conditions, the nidana, for events in the actual present. And in the context of the Vinaya, for example, it describes the conditions for a concrete legal decision. Uh, and then we have a second uh, frame narrative, namely an avadana, itivrutaka, jataka, or upama, which describes events typically occurring in the past, and these are intended, uh, of course, as the analogy for the main narrative. However, both these main and frame sections are also analogical to the extent they both point outside of themselves to the Dharma, an ideology such as a law, precept or doctrine, which is the analog or subject of both narratives and to which they relate in partial correspondence. The status of any such dharma, even though it was uttered by the Buddha as the authority on truth, is nonetheless propositional and potential, being but the idea of law. It is something that can or perhaps ought to exist, for a law is always, Ill always illocutionary, but it also need not exist and so requires actualization, a perlocutionary role served by the narratives in convincing others of the truth to which they pertain. The relation between the Dharma and the two narrative frames is therefore a relation between what can or ought to be and what is or was. And this elusive Dharma remains but a possibility until it finds correspondence in the real world relations expressed by the narrative from which it can therefore be inferred. Avadhanas were thus central to legal procedures, and it is for this reason, no doubt, that several, several Sarvastivadin works attribute the transmission of Avadhanas to bearers of the Vinaya, Vinaya Dahara, and also that the Dasha Bhumika uh, Vibhasha, which is attributed uh, to Nagarjuna, uh, similarly states that one should approach this figure, this uh, bearer of the Vinaya, if one wants to know about the conditions, the Nidana, for the transgression of rules, and how such case law is illustrated in Avadanas. Um, so now let us turn to consider the example of the Dirgila Avadana to see how I understand this to work more concretely. Um, so there are 15 versions or references to the Dirgila Avadana in Chinese, Pali, and Sanskrit, two in the Majamagama and Ekotarikagama, six in the Kaushambi Skandaka of the Sarvastivada, Mahishasaka, Dhammaguptaka, Mula Sarvastivada, Theravada, and Mahasamgika Vinayas, and seven in independent Avadana and Jataka versions, such as the aforementioned Uddana and Kalpanamanditika. In these witnesses, the narrative is given different titles, including Dirgila Avadana, Dirgila Sutra, and Dirgila Jataka, amongst others, uh, pointing to both the popularity of the narrative and the formal fluidity of its retelling. From a historical perspective, uh, this narrative is therefore highly significant. For by virtue of the numerosity of its witnesses, we are provided with a rare opportunity to consider the nature of the narrative before and after the affirmation of Avadana as a canonical limb, namely before the construction of the uh, Dvadashanga, the 12 limbs of the canon. Um, uh, so today it's impossible for me to delve into this history uh, simply because it will take us too far from the present point uh, regarding analogy and uh, suffice to say that through a consideration of these various versions, it is possible to identify the hermeneutical effect of Avadana as analogy, which resulted namely in the identification of the Dirgila Avadana within the Vinaya, um, its subsequent extraction and insertion into other compendia, such as the Majamagama, or indeed its reformulation within, a narrat within narrative collections, such as the uh, Udana, Kalpanamanditika, or other Jataka works. Um, now, I also cannot delve into the twists and turns of all these uh, narratives, but I think a short summary shall also suffice to illustrate the point I wish to make. Thus, uh, in brief, the whole narrative is constituted of two frames, one set in the Buddha's present and another in the past, namely the Avadana, which analogizes the former. The main narrative relates that two groups of monks in Kaushambi repeatedly quarreled, which caused schism within the community. Um, <clears throat> and in several Vinayas, this quarrel takes on a legal tenor, constituting a dispute between two factions over whether one individual monk should or should not be expelled for not admitting and repenting a Prayaschitika offense. <clears throat> 
in the Mura Savastivada and Mahasangika Vinayas, the reason for the quarrel is more specific still, concerning a dispute over the cleaning of a chamber pot and the correct application of various legal procedures to, uh, to resolve the issue. And uh, throughout these heated arguments, the Buddha advises the monks thrice that angry quarreling and hate will not end, will, will not end with further hate and only with patience or loving kindness, which is, of course, the proposition these stories are intended to analogize. But the monks remain unresolved, at which point the Buddha draws on an analogy uh, in a past narrative frame to drill home the point. Um, <clears throat> so this past... Uh, frame relates how two rulers, uh, Brahmadatta of Kashi and Dirgila of Kosala, repeatedly warred until the latter was defeated and forced into exile with his wife and son, Dirgayu. Dirgila is eventually captured by Brahmadatta, who orders his execution and dismemberment in a public square. But before his execution, Dirgila advises his son to observe patience and loving kindness. Dirgayu later finds work in Brahmadatta's elephant enclosure and eventually inf infiltrates the king's inner circle, which gives him the opportunity to take revenge and kill Brahmadatta. However, he recalls his father's advice and spares Brahmadatta's life, after which they are resolved and Dir Dirgayu's kingdom is returned to him. So the purpose of this uh, whole narrative <clears throat> is to compare the similarities and differences between the two cases, respectively of monastic law in the target domain and governmental politics in the source domain, and to infer through what eventuates in the narratives, namely non-resolution and resolution, the doctrinal principle that hate only ends, um, hate only ends with uh, patience, uh, forbearance, uh, and loving kindness, which the quarrelsome monks should therefore cultivate by following the rules. But uh, even after the Buddha's analogy, the monks remain unresolved, suggesting that even the Buddha's authority and usage of Avadana as analogy was not always fully accepted or fully appreciated. Um, so this story concerns a narrower case of monastic legal procedure where an avadana as analogy served to justify supra positivistic moral principles and their positivistic instantiations in law. More generally, however, avadanas serve to analogize other items of dharma that are pertinent to the laity. And thus the narrative mode was also used to justify Buddhist ideology when communicated to the world outside the inner logic of the monastic domain. Um, so in sum, I hope to have shown how the affirmation of Avadana as a canonical limb, as well as its definition as analogy, served a specific hermeneutic function, leading to a reinterpretation and reclassification of existent narrative literature, uh, which ultimately changed the shape of the canon, um, as well as inspiring the composition of numerous Avadana narratives, which were organized in compendia around the principle of analogy. Evidence for this, as we saw, is to be found in certain Kaharoshti manuscripts, um, as well as Chinese translations of, of uh, uh, earlier Abhidana collections, such as the Samyukta Abhidana, the Udana, and the Itivritika and Jataka, or indeed extended metaphors, such as illustrations, Udaharana, and similes, Upama, were grouped together, having been conflated under the meta-category of Avadana as analogy. One may further venture in this connection that this hermeneutic is the very reason that all the various terms for analogy in Sanskrit, Avadana, Drishtanta, Upama, and so forth, were translated into Chinese with the same term, Piyu, um, uh, at, the same, at the time when Avadanas were first transmitted to China from the second century CE. The emergence of Avadana, I suggested, is to be situated within a broader epistemological turn that had occurred in South Asia. <clears throat> Um, and it was also uh, the project of certain narratologists, such as the aforementioned Darshtantika scholars, to develop strategies to justify propositions of doctrine, law, and morality, and to convince others thereof. The question that remains to me is whether the contemporaneous emergence of art at Buddhist monastic sites is also to be attributed to this epistemological trend, and whether this principle of analogy served a similar organizational function in the selection and representation of narrative and art. Evidently, a narrative in written prose cannot be isomorphically translated into a relief or into a painting, and a narrative in art is limited by further concerns also, such as the space in which it is represented and the purpose that this space served, as in the cultic functions of Jatakas at stupa sites in Gandhara. Narrative in the media of both text and image certainly serve similar didactic functions, um, but uh, ascertaining whether this logic of analogy is to be discerned in the latter uh, 
lies beyond my grasp at present. Uh, so this for me must remain uh, an open question and all that remains to be done is to thank, uh, thank you all for having me and for listening.